Good evening and welcome to the Journey Home program. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this weekly program, which I have the great privilege of introducing to you men and women who, because of their great love for Jesus Christ, came home to the Catholic Church. They have to take a whole lifetime and summarize it into about 25 minutes, but we appreciate your prayers because they've got a lot to say and a lot to talk about how God has changed their life. Our guest tonight is Carl Colhase. We list him as a former Protestant, but he's, he, he, he touched into a couple buckets on his journey, and he'll tell you about that in a moment. But I want to remind you that you are an essential part of this program. So if you'd like to give us a call, you can do so at 1-800-221-9460. Or if you're outside North America, you can call us at 205-271-2980. Or you can send me an email at journeyhome at EWTN. Dot com. Carl, welcome to the journey home. Thank you, Marcus. You come a long way south from that the cold tundra of uh, northern Minnesota, right? Northern Minnesota, yeah. I mean, you're far north of Minnesota. About right? three and a half hours north of Minneapolis. So how close to Canada? An uh, hour. Oh, so you're just, you're there. Yeah, practically Canadian. I was going to say, you're canoe country, but right now it's all frozen, isn't it? Or are it's we there getting yet? there. It's getting there. We've had our first snow already. So. All right. Well, it's good to have you here. It's good to be here. Let me get out of the way and invite you to share with the audience a, a little bit of your early spiritual journey. Well, I, I grew up Lutheran and uh, was very blessed to have a mother who uh, faithfully brought us kids to church mm -hmm. every Sunday, um, made sure I was baptized, confirmed, gave me my first Bible when I was confirmed, even though it <laughs> sat on the shelf for many years until... I was older, but you know, I had that kind of an upbringing. I'm very, very thankful for that. And um, when I was in high school, I kind of turned away from my faith and uh, s picked up the guitar when I was about 12 years old. Started playing in rock bands, and and just by the time I was 10th, 11th grade, lived a typical <laughs> life of a rock and roller, I guess, and and uh, which was contrary to the gospel in, in almost every way. You know what I the lifestyle that I had chosen. And, uh, but it wasn't a conflict for you at the time, right? It, well, it, it wasn't because I didn't know that God had any demands on my life at the time or yeah. didn't know that He w even was interested in, <laughs> in me following Him, I guess. I don't know if, I, if it wasn't being preached at church or I just wasn't ready to hear it, yeah. you know. But uh, when I was 18, a senior in high school, um, things started to really change for me. When, for instance, I would go to church, a Lutheran church, and I would feel really guilty about, you know, and that was kind of a new thing. It was, I was like, <laughs> this is a double standard for me. I'm sitting here in church and totally living contrary to everything I'm hearing. And uh, that was a new thing. And now I realize, you know, the Holy Spirit was yeah. just confronting with me with my sin and saying, repent. I love you. I want you to come. <laughs> and uh, so I wanted to know more about who God was, and I picked up that Bible that my mother had given me for confirmation, started reading it. And when I got to the Gospel of John in particular, and I read that Jesus was saying, come and follow me, and I'll make you a fisher of men, those words just absolutely jumped off the page at me, and it was, that's exactly what I need to do. I, I knew that at that point that Jesus was alive. It wasn't just a story from antiquity, you know. He was the living Savior, and He was calling me personally to follow Him, and and uh, that's the decision I made. I said, Lord, you know all the <laughs> the life I've lived, which is contrary, but I I believe in you, and I want to follow you, and I started taking um, some very drastic steps, and and my, confounded my friends. They were like, What happened to Carl? You know, the, that's not the Carl we knew, and uh, but I was just so exuberant about what I'd found. I found life eternal, you know, through Jesus Christ and was very excited about that. So I was, I started looking for ways, to, how can I fulfill that second half of Christ's call? You know, he says, follow me and I'll make you fisher of men. And uh, being a musician, I thought, well, I could use that to proclaim the gospel. So I called a friend of mine who I used to play in bands with 
and uh, I had heard that he had a similar conversion and he was in an Assemblies of God Bible College down in Minneapolis. So I called him up and said, hey, you know, I'm thinking about starting a Christian rock band. And, uh, and he says, well, that's, that's a great idea, but really I feel called to study to be a preacher. But there's plenty of musicians down here. Why don't you come? And, and uh, so I decided, well, that sounds good. So I went to this Assemblies of God Bible College, didn't have any idea what I was getting into from a Lutheran <laughs> you background. You didn't even know how different it was. I, I had no clue. You know, I didn't know what, what charismatics were or, or um, anything about it. So I got there, and it was a little, it was odd, and yet I felt, I felt good about being there, especially because there was, there was a lot, all of a sudden, there was a lot of people my age who were just as excited as I was about proclaiming Christ. There were a lot of people my age that wanted to get into the scriptures and deeply, wanted to spend time in prayer, wanted to get out on the streets and, and tell the homeless, you know, <laughs> tell anyone who listened about who Jesus was. And so, I, you know, I was, I was hooked. This, is, this was good for me. I was in the Assemblies of God Church for uh, maybe two years and um, started to become a little bit disillusioned because for me, the charismatic movement uh, tended to lead me towards a kind of a roller coaster ride emotionally. Whereas when I was feeling ecstatic, it had some sort of ecstatic expression or some fluttering in my heart, then that must mean I'm close to God. But in those dry times, when you weren't feeling anything and you weren't, you know, it wasn't there, it was like, Lord, where are you? Yeah, I don't. I don't feel you anymore, you know, so that was a real problem. Well, <clears throat> at about that time, in one of those lower states, I um, met a pastor from the United Pentecostal Church, and uh, they had, I've s now realized they have a lot of really odd doctrines and yeah. far off yeah, base. But, you know, at the time I was young and, and uh, disillusioned, and uh, this pastor was very, very good at opening up the scriptures and saying, this is, look at this verse and this verse and this verse and how it all fits together. And uh, for instance, they didn't believe in a trinity, uh, which is probably their, their major heresy. But interestingly, no, I wasn't there very long. Um, one of their arguments, one of their chief arguments, Marcus, was, you know, we're just trying to reclaim the faith from of old. This is what the first Christians taught and believed. And so I said, yeah, well, I want to learn about that. So I picked up some uh, church history books and started reading the writings of Clement and Polycarp, Polycarp and Ignatius and <laughs> these first and second century believers. And I was just blown away. You know, not only did they have, they didn't use the word Trinity, but they had very Trinitarian ideas. They, there was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and yet not three gods, one God. But uh, what surprised me even more was that there was infant baptism, there was bishops, and you know, a, a succession of bishops through the laying on of hands. There was a profound, uh, well-articulated belief in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. They believed that that is the flesh and blood of Christ. And I thought, well, how can this be? This sounds really, really Catholic. I mean, through and through, these first and second century believers sound Catholic to the core. And I hear I had been taught for however many years that these were just uh, inventions of the Dark Ages, you know. So I wasn't quite ready to become a Catholic at that point, so I went back to the Lutheran Church just to find something familiar, you know. I, I knew I wanted the Trinity again. Well, let me ask you, you said, right, I mean, did, did the concept, of the conception of pos possibly becoming Catholic really enter your mind at that point? Or? Uh, it did, it did. Okay. In fact, I, I so actually you didn't really went grow up with an idea of an anti-Catholic perspective? No. Okay. I didn't grow up with one, but, you know, having been, I think in my years as in Assemblies of God, I think that there were Pretty some strong, very yeah. strong anti-Catholic yeah. sentiments there. I was in, introduced to uh, Jack, tr Jack Chick, oh, sure. Tricks, uh, what do we call them? Tracks, tracks, those yeah. little gospel tracks, you know, which are very, very anti-Catholic. And so I was 
uh, confronted with that. And, and the particularly United Pente Pentecostalism, which would be anti-Trinitarian oh, yeah. perspective, so you would get some of it there. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So the, the, the thought f f flitted around a little bit, but quickly went. Uh, Quick, quickly went. I, in fact, I had gone to even speak with a priest and was sort of disillusioned because he was of the opinion, well, what God really wants is for me to be a good Catholic and for you to be a good Protestant. And I thought, well, if, if that's the way you feel about it, I guess, you know, <laughs> I guess I don't need to be a Catholic. So I just went back to the Lutheran Church just to have some familiar roots and uh, met my wife to be, who was a member of the Evangelical Free Church. Mm -hmm. And when I visited her church, I really fell in love with those people. They're really warm, caring people, loved the scriptures, loved God, uh, exuberant praise and wonderful fellowship. And so that really felt home to us. We were married and uh, had our first son and decided that I was going to study for the ministry. So we went out to Portland, Oregon, to a conservative Baptist seminary out there, and uh, studied for a couple of years and had an opportunity to go back to that church in northern Minnesota, Evangelical Free Church, to become a full-time director of youth and music ministries. So, and absolutely, I really loved that. I mean, spending, here I w had the opportunity of spending those 40 hours a week doing what I really loved to do, which was proclaim Jesus and, and lead others to faith. So you had started that rock band way back when? Uh, I, I, never Christian? I never did get a chance to. I, I, <laughs> I was so excited about uh, just going out on the streets and evangelizing to the homeless and whoever would listen to it, that uh, I never got a chance to do that but at that time. music had become a big part of your proclamation of the gospel during those years. Right, right. I, you know, I had gone to school for music and studied orchestration and yeah. things okay. like that. So. When I, before we move on, though, <clears throat> I want to look back a little bit because it, it fascinates me how often I hear the uh, similar stories about especially Lutherans, maybe Anglicans, but a lot of Lutherans, and I was kind of in that same boat, mm -hmm. kind of you baptize, catechize, confirmed, but then quickly leave it. Hmm. And you know, part of the frustration of parents is, well, you know, what, what, what could I have done differently? And like you said, it's hard to know why it didn't catch. Right. But if you look back, uh, any thoughts on what was missing? Or was it just not your timing in, in God's plan at that point? Well, I think it could be that, you know, I, I really honestly don't know if it was because it wasn't being preached from the pulpit or if it just was I was not ready to hear it yet. I do know that, um, you know, when I was young, the pastor that was there was very, very, he, he was a good gospel preacher, you know. Yeah. And some of the later pastors, I, I think, maybe had lost sight of some of that. So I wasn't hearing a, a call to conversion, a call to following Christ. Like I said, I don't know if it was yeah. because of lack of preaching or if it was just But internal. you also then mentioned earlier, you know, all of a sudden, you, you know, you're, you're feeling a bit of guilt. Where does that come from? Right. You open the scriptures, a verse jumps out at you. I mean, to me that all emphasizes the power of grace. And part of the reason I wanted to mention that is I know that from reading emails and letters of viewers that there are a lot of parents and grandparents out there that get discouraged because their children went through the same journey. Mm -hmm. You know, they came, thought we put them through the system of the church, thought they got the education, did all that we could, and then they left. And it's hard to put a finger on why. It's too easy to start blaming, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's just this timing of God's grace. So that's why we never give up praying, right? Absolutely. You just never know when grace might touch someone just in the same way he touched you. Mm -hmm. You're reading the Bible. And all of a sudden, boom, or you could be singing a piece of music or, or watching a movie. You never know how God might turn your heart towards Him. Mm. But there you are doing what you had dreamed of doing. You're teaching with music and, you know, things seem, they're just cruising along. But then all of a sudden you start, uh, your heart starts opening up towards the Catholic Church. Well, how'd that happen? Well, I, I, I look at it. It's sort of in three phases, my conversion to the Catholic Church. And uh, the first time that I considered becoming a Catholic was after being involved in that United Pentecostal group. And they were saying, hey, you need to look at the early church. You know, they, they didn't believe that way. And I saw that, well, they were thoroughly Catholic in just about every way. 
And so that was the first time I considered did, it. Did your United Pre uh, Pentecostal friends say anything about the early church fathers? I mean, what, what was their view of them? I, I don't know. Do you remember? I, I don't <laughs> remember even how they responded to that. I think they were like, just kind of astonished that I actually did the homework and s said, well, you're saying that the early church is like that, you know, well, let me go look. Yeah. And uh, when I did look, I was just dumbfounded that, okay. wow, this, this is Catholic through and through. Um, and and it, it really surprised me, too, that these were men who had, some of them whom, whom had sat under the apostles themselves, you know, were taught by the Apostle John, or uh, just amazed me. The second time, surprisingly, that I considered um, the Catholic Church was, of all places, I was at the Conservative Baptist Seminary. And uh, here we were in theology class, and we came across the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus says to Peter, then Simon, he says, you are Peter, you are a rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And my professor said, you know, I'm kind of going out of limb on this one, and my fellow professors don't like me even bringing this up. Um, they would much prefer that we look at when Jesus says, upon this rock, that we look at the faith of Peter, or we look at Christ, who is the cornerstone. Or he says, in my study, the most plain rendering of that in the original languages is that he's referring to Peter as, upon this rock, I'll build my church. And he, he just explained that um, Peter had a certain primacy among the Twelve, if you look in the book of Acts, you know, on the day of Pentecost, it was Peter who stands up to preach that first sermon, or he takes a prominent role in, um, in the councils in the book of Acts. And, uh, but he was qu quick to dismiss the whole idea of apostolic succession, you know. He said, if Peter was the first pope, he was the last pope as well, you know. And, of course, I, having studied church history, knew that that wasn't really the yeah. case. There was a succession. In fact, Paul even mentioned to Timothy that through the laying on of his hands, yeah. that he was going to be installed and that he should, you know, teach others to, Second to uh, Timothy two two yeah. do, do the right. same. Right. And so I knew that there was a, a succession there, and I thought, wow, am I supposed to be a Catholic? <laughs> but I, I quickly dismissed it, and the reason being was. I thought, like, this must be a temptation. You know, I'm here studying to be a Protestant minister. I think maybe, maybe Satan just wants to get me off track. So I kind of pushed it off to the side, had an opportunity to, to um, be in full-time ministry, and so went forward with that. But, you know, that didn't mean that I closed the Bible, you know. So every time I'd come across these verses where, you know, Jesus would say, this is my body. This is my blood. Or, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. Or Jesus saying to his apostles on the day he was risen from the dead, he says, whoever sins you forgive, they'll be forgiven. And I thought, who does that? That's, a, that's only in the Catholic Church, you know. And I just couldn't, I couldn't deny it anymore. And um, so I started to uh, wrestle with God on that because I really didn't want to become a Catholic at all. <laughs> um, for a number of reasons, but primarily because I was married and was in full-time ministry. That was my livelihood. And I really had placed all my eggs in one basket. You know, I'd, I'd studied music, which isn't, doesn't have many career options, and I'd studied ministry. And uh, I knew that if, if I was a Catholic, that, you know, there's my employment opportunities right there. And then also, I think it, I knew it would bring a lot of dishonor and discord for my family because, you know, all of a sudden I would go from, oh, look at Carl, here's a man of God, and, you know, there's a level of esteem there. All of a sudden, all those people that would once have looked up to me would now kind of shake their head and say, poor deceived fellow, you know, he, he's gone off the deep end. And so I didn't want to do that, and, and I was... I was praying, God, if you, if you want me to become a Catholic, you're going to have to give me some sort of a sign. Um, nothing, nothing big. Maybe if you just come down to the cloud or, <laughs> or send Mary or, or uh, the Apostle Paul, who was a hero of mine. And, and that never happened. And, uh, but I kept praying and praying, God, I, I'm going to need a sign. And one day I was, when I was praying that, it was as if uh, I heard this question saying, 
Carl, did you need a sign back when you were 18 years old and you first trusted Christ? And I said, no. All I needed was the Word of God, which was, I knew it was the truth. I was absolutely convinced of it, and that's all I need. And then it dawned on me, well, that's what God is saying to me. You didn't need it then, you're not going to need it now. You're going to have to step out in faith. And uh, so I, I made a deal with the Lord. I said, God, if I can be as convinced of the Catholic Church as I was back then and still am, that Jesus is the Son of God, risen from the dead, I'll become a Catholic. It'll become a matter of, of obedience, not a matter of preference. You know, it's not like choosing chocolate or, or vanilla ice cream. This is a matter of obedience now because I'll be convinced. And uh, so that was my prayer, and I, and I decided what I was going to do is I'm going to throw every question I have at, at the church, and I'm going to try to debunk it because I did not want to become a Catholic. <laughs> so I threw every question I could at it and found that the church was an impenetrable fortress. It just had an airtight logic to it. And every question that I would throw at it, I would find an answer, and it was like, Oh yeah, if I open my heart and look at it with, from, an, from an honest perspective and really give it a chance, then it's, this just makes absolute sense through and through. And it's a, it's a cohesive whole. The whole argument makes absolute sense. So I got to that place where I had to hold up my end of the bargain. You know, I, I, I told the Lord if I would be that convinced that I would, I would obey Him. And uh, so that's what I did. And um, told my wife that that was my intention to become a Catholic, turned in my resignation, mm. and on Pentecost of 2000, entered into the church. And wow. Haven't looked back. Now, <clears throat> in some of the reasons that you were drawn to the Catholic Church, because the Eucharist um, and some of the other beliefs, very similar to your Lutheran back, did you ever consider during that part of the journey, now that you're either you were Pentecostal and then you were uh, evangelical free, of returning to your Lutheran roots, had that been a, a thought? Or? Uh, well, it, like I said, when I had been involved with the Pentecostal group, I did go back to the Lutheran church for a yeah. while just because I wanted something familiar. Yeah. And I knew that I wanted some place that was Trinitarian and had some, some solidity to it. Um, but no, I... I, I really was absolutely convinced of you. Yeah. I just Catholic wonder if you had Church. dealt with the distinctions, the unique distinctions. I mean, they look real similar, but many of the key issues, they aren't. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, uh, those are questions I, I threw at it as well. I mean, looking at justification by, by faith alone, you know, and realizing that the only place that that is mentioned in the Bible is in James, where it says that we are not justified by faith alone, which... You know, how can, we, how can yeah. I believe a doctrine where it explicitly says that that's not, not true? Right. So. Were you able to continue using your music when you I came home? I mean, it's, it's hard to know when you're in that side of the Tiber River and you're going to jump over what you're going to do. Yeah, it, 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 that's been an essential uh, part of keeping me sane, I think, really, because <laughs> here I was in the ministry full-time, spending 40 hours a week proclaiming Jesus, doing what I love to do. And when I, when I gave my resignation, I needed to find a job. And so I had to take whatever came across my path and ended up doing marketing for a snowmobile company, <laughs> which was, uh, I mean, it's a thousand miles apart, you know. S here I am s selling expensive toys to, to men. And uh, all day long, literally, I would sit at my desk, do my work, creating websites or whatever, <sighs> sighing. You know, just feeling the emptiness of, I used to spend this time proclaiming Jesus, yeah. and now I am selling snowmobiles, which was very, very uh, disappointing for me. But what I decided to do was, and this is uh, the grace of God really providing, I took my music and I created a CD and um, decided that while well, I used some of these new marketing abilities that I was learning in this job, you know, creating websites and whatnot. I said, I'm just going to put it out there. Um, I had first 
tried to go to churches, Catholic churches, and uh, was told by a number of priests, you know, Catholics just don't do concerts, <laughs> <laughs> which, which I've come to realize now, you know, is n not really the case. But some do, but some do. Not, yeah, some do. It's a little harder marketing job. Yeah, yeah. So, but I've been able to uh, get get those CDs out on out on the internet. Have four now released where people can download the MP3s for for free and. And for me, that was a real gift of God because all of a sudden, well, now I'm still working a, a full-time job, but I'm able still to proclaim Christ, which is, yeah. well, yeah. there's an outlet for that, you know, so it, it uh, kept me sane. Why don't, you, why don't you say your website for those that are listening on radio? Sure. It's www.k4communications.com. All right. That's a number four, K4. Number four. Okay, K4. And uh, at the end of tonight's program, we're going to do something a little different. Instead of the usual closing tune that you're familiar with in the Journey Home program, we're going to, uh, at the end of the program, play a little snippet of one of your songs, right? That's right. Okay, we'll talk about that later. Let's take a break. We come back, we'll take some uh, phone calls and email questions for you in a second. Back in a moment. Welcome back to The Journey Home. Our guest tonight is Carl Colhays. Let me give you the phone numbers again so that, uh, remember again, your, your calls are very important for us. We have a number of calls and emails, but there's still a little more room if you have a question. 1-800-221-9460. Outside North America, 205-271-2980. Or you can send an email at journeyhome at ewtn.com. Before we take our first email, I want to mention something that Carl's experience uh, reminds me of something that I, I often have said, but I want to make sure that that we need to pray for the converts that come into the church with great gifts and experiences and opportunities, and how God will continue to use their gifts when they become Catholic. That's not always obvious, especially when you come from a different way churches operate into the Catholic Church. How do you understand the system? How do you get people to know what you can do and what you'd like to do. Mm -hmm. So that's a constant issue with many of our guests, as it is with Carl. So for those of you watching, whenever you could see places in your local churches that need musicians and youth ministers and all kinds of opportunities, there are lots of both converts as well as you might call reborn Catholics, people that have gotten on fire for their faith and want to be involved in some kind of apostolic work. There are plenty of opportunities, and one of the most common things that John Paul emphasized was the need for the laity to remember their call to the apostolic ministry. And that's what we're, we're frontline ministers, are mm. the, uh, the laity in the church. So lots of people with gifts, we need to see what doors are available for them, men like Carl. Let's take our first email, this comes from Doug. Marcus and Carl, I'm not Catholic and I'm still having a difficult time trying to understand praying to Mary, but I cannot seem to get any level of comfort in my current spiritual state either, so I'm still searching. Many, many thanks for your broadcast. It is so evident that you have a pastor's heart. Doug, thanks for your email. And first of all, I want to ask everyone that's watching to pray for Doug. A lot of people like that on the journey. And Doug, I appreciate your email very, very much. And <coughs> we've been there. I mean, we know the struggle. What about Mary for your own journey? Right. Mary was, uh, was one of the hardest things for me to uh, it was the hardest obstacle for me to overcome. In fact, even after becoming a Catholic, you know, it, it was hard for me to embrace her role in my life. I, I liken it to, you know, after 15 years of eating onions, you know, you can brush your teeth once and you're still not going to get rid of the taste. <laughs> and that aftertaste kind of lingers. But uh, I've since really learned that uh, Mary and all the saints, that not only does God permit us to uh, talk to them, but that it's really God's desire. If you look at um, 
the apostles, the apostle Paul, for instance, he would talk about that God was preparing for him a crown. And you look at Revelation where Jesus says, those who overcome are going to share my throne. They're, they're going to have thrones of their own and, and power and dominion and authority. And so to, to realize that not only does God permit it, but it is God's will to heap glory and honor upon those who were faithful to him and endured suffer, suffering and hardship for his sake. He wants to heap glory and honor upon them. So when we participate in that, we're really doing God's will. That's helped me, I think. Very good. Mary is a, 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 a difficult barrier for so many converts, especially coming from backgrounds where Mary is hardly ever mentioned. Right. right especially probably your Pentecostal background. Right. Mary was probably not, other than Christmas, Mary was probably never mentioned at all. I mean, that's common. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go to Mark from California. Hello, Mark. What's your question for us tonight? Hey, good evening, Marcus and Carl. Yeah. Before I make my uh, question here, I just want to say how truly amazing this, this show is, Marcus. What you've done with this ministry is just absolutely incredible for non-Catholics and Catholics alike. The way that you bring forth the truth of the faith through this forum is just it's unlike anything we've had, um, you know, in the past, and for Catholics to be able to see this along with non-Catholics to bring this out, all the truths that you bring out in this way is incredible. Well, Mark, let me say thank you for that, but it's always the guests. You know, they're the ones that share their powerful stories and uh, in encouragement to us all. So uh, That's true. praise God for the, the courage of the guests to get on and share their story. Thanks, Mark. Right. What else you got? Yes, I was just going to ask uh, Carl to maybe bring out a... Um, one of his most memorable stories from the last several years about bringing his newfound faith to some of his old friends, some of his old Protestant <laughs> friends, when he, specifically theologically, when you've gone into scripture readings and you've talked about the fathers of the church and you've brought this to any friends, I'd love to just hear a, an interesting story about how maybe you converted someone or you made really someone think about what they were currently doing and, and, you know, them looking at you and saying, maybe I need to reconsider. I'd like to hear a, a good story along those lines. Thanks, guys. Okay, thanks for your question. Right. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of um, experience with people just up and converting because of what I've, what I've said to them, you know. But, <laughs> but maybe, maybe, you know, seeds are planted here and there just by, by seeing what I was willing to uh, give up and, yeah. and do just for the sake of my conviction, you know, so... It, that's the way it is with evangelism. Sometimes I think you just you're sowing seeds, and sometimes you don't see that fruit for many years to come. Well, your your life again is an example of that. I mean, you had that awakening later when you opened up the Book of John, and all of a sudden that verse. But you had had many seeds planted earlier, mm -hmm. right? The grace of baptism, your confirmation, your catechesis, lots of Sunday school classes, your mother that loved you, and led you into faith. Lots of seeds were planted there that right. came alive. That's right. And that's just like this, sharing a bit about the faith with some of your friends. I mean, they might be shocked and ready to hit you with a, a baseball bat at first, but later you never know. Right? Mm, that's true. That's true. That's right. All right, let's go with Guy, your email. Dear Carl, what Catholic inspired you the most on your journey to the Catholic Church? God bless, Guy. Thanks. Well, your program, Marcus, has really been a, a help for me because, you know, I would look, watch your program and think, okay, I'm not going crazy here. There, <laughs> there are other Protestant ministers who have considered the Catholic faith and made the same, same step, you know, which was very, very helpful for me because I knew that I wasn't totally in left field there. <laughs> but uh, I think that the writings of, of uh, the early church fathers were really a clincher for me, especially Clement and Polycarp and Ignatius and, uh, you know, I think you have it on your website to be steeped sure. in, in uh, what, how do you say? Well, it's from Car uh, John Henry Cardinal Newman, to become deep in history is to cease to be Protestant yeah. in, in the sense of when you really understand right. and you read those early fathers, I mean, that's, there have been awakening for so many mm -hmm. on that. And uh, nowadays you can go to the internet and find the inter early church fathers are there. You can download them and read them. Uh, they're available to everyone, and that's the beauty of them. Mm. Okay, Mark from Alabama. Hello, what's your question for us tonight? Hi, Marcus. Hello, Mark. Um, I uh, wanted to thank Carl for his very compelling and personal story. 
Um, and so many of your guests are seem to be academics and pastors and able to, to use their intellects uh, to find their way into the church. And my wife and I um, have many conversations with neighbors and friends who are outside of the church in, in Protestant uh, denominations. Yeah. And uh, without, without the, that, that heavy firepower of the, the gift of the intellect to be able to reason their way into the faith or read the, the church fathers, um, how are they able to make the journey home and how can we help them to do that? Good question, Mark. Thank you very much for watching the program, too. So, you know, the, I guess the way I would approach that is that, you know, sometimes uh, on some difficult questions, I'll just say, because that's what the church teaches, you know. I, I don't have any, any um, stronger theological point than that. It's just that's what the church teaches. And I realized a long time ago, Marcus, that I, I don't make a very good pope unto myself. You know, that, that old notion of all you need to come to the knowledge of the truth is a sincere conscience and the Holy Spirit and the Bible, I, I don't think is, is really accurate because I, I've been uh, convinced of opposing doctrines using that very same approach, you know. So being, I, I've failed at, at being a pope. <laughs> Were you involved with, brought up Lutheran, uh, you were Assembly of God, United Pentecostal, mm -hmm. uh, and then later Evangelical Free. All four of those Christian traditions, they don't want to use the word tradition, but tr right. you know, believe in just what you've said. Following your conscience, guided by the Holy Spirit, reading mm -hmm. Scripture will come to truth. But those four teach radically different things. Right. You know, and so it makes it hard. And this is a great question, Mark. Uh, let me address it also because it isn't uh, Carl Zormai or Scott Hans or many of the other converts you've seen. It's our, it isn't our great intellect. Uh, it, that isn't it. Um, it's, first of all, grace that God awakened us to see something, see either there was a problem where we were or to see an answer that we never saw before. It was a gift of the Holy Spirit but also, uh, on a more mundane level, it was seeing data that we never had before. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's it. You know, Carl, you had the data of the early church fathers that you never saw before because no one showed it to you, never read them. Mm -hmm. And many of the, our neighbors who won't consider the Catholic Church, part of it is they've never received the data. No one's ever told them what the Catholic Church really teaches. You said this is what the church teaches. Part of that's a confusion. Sometimes they think the church teaches we worship Mary. Church has never taught that. Church has taught that's a heresy to worship Mary. So what does the church really teach about Mary? Well, then that's what we can share with them what the church teaches. Mm -hmm. And we live at a great time because now we have the catechism. We have the compendium of the catechism, which uh, simplifies it. You've got great websites like EWTN.com or go to chnetwork.org, places where you can let your friends hear what the church really teaches. And of course, that's one of the reasons EWTN is here, to, to encourage your friends to turn the radio or the television to hear stories like Carl, that maybe that'll soften their, under, their previous prejudice against the church to become open to what the church really teaches. But it's all part of the, our evangelistic ministry. Sure. Let's go with our next email, Rachel from Texas. Marcus and Carl, I am a ninth, in ninth grade. Hmm. And during World Geography class, excuse me, class, the teacher asked, how would you explain the Trinity, one God in three persons, to someone who doesn't believe it? Thanks, Rachel, for your easy question. <laughs> <laughs> Great question, Rachel. Oh, I, I think I'm going to leave that one to you. <laughs> it's, a, it's very difficult to explain. It's beyond our... Our understanding, Rachel, you know, it's uh, God is a, a mystery it, and beyond, beyond words, really. Yep. Other than we know that there is a Father, there is a Son, there is a Holy Spirit, and there's only one God. Yep. Yep. I mean, that's as close as we can get. We do the best we can. The early church fought over a great many of 
alternative explanations hmm. in the fourth century. And that's one of the reasons why every Sunday we proclaim the Nicene Creed, all those different phrases, one God, true God from true God, begotten, not made one and being with the Father. These, every one of those phrases is to counteract mm -hmm. another way of, of uh, trying to understand it that wasn't quite right. So Rachel, it's not an easy question, but there are lots of questions out there that aren't easy. I mean, what's matter? We, we really can't see down mm -hmm. at that lo lowest molecular. We get down to real close, right. but it becomes a mystery. And if that's a mystery, well then God's going to be even more of a mystery because of his immenseness. But look at the catechism, Rachel, and uh, it discusses that and see if that helps you come up with a good answer for your friends. And uh, uh, maybe even go to EWTN's website and find a bigger description. But it's a, it's a rough one. It's one that really needs grace to understand. And I think, you know, uh, the picture of Christ's baptism is probably a good place for Rachel to start, you know, where you have, have Jesus being baptized and the Holy Spirit descending like a dove upon him and then the voice of God the Father saying, this is my beloved Son. So you have the three persons of the Trinity right there. That would be a good place for her to start. Okay, Roger from Vermont, what's your question for us tonight? Hello, Roger. Uh, hi, Carl. I, Marcus, rather. Yes. I enjoy your program very much. Thanks, Roger. And I have a question for Carl, and you you have already answered part of it. But Carl, you have said uh, many times in the beginning of the show, you didn't want to become a Catholic. Why were you so afraid of becoming a Catholic? It was because of yourself or your family or friends. What is the reason? You know, I hear that from many people, and. And I don't know what they were taught earlier in their lives, what was so bad about being a Catholic. So if you could explain on that, I, w I would like to hear you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Roger. That's a very good question, Roger. It w what I meant by that it was not because of I, I wasn't leaning towards believing that way, but really because there was a lot at stake for me. Um, I knew it would bring discord into my family. I knew it would mean the loss of my employment since I was a full-time minister. And that was going to be very difficult for me. And like I would said, I would placed all my eggs in one basket. I had studied music and ministry, and uh, both those can be pulled out from underneath me. So uh, just the, the sheer level of cost, personally, I didn't want to do it unless I was absolutely 100% sure. You know, this gives me a chance to explain to the audience a few symbols in the set that they're here every week, but you may not appreciate their symbols. Behind the guest every week is that beautiful Rembrandt painting of the return of the sun. And the reason it's there is because that's what we felt like when we came home, is that our Heavenly Father welcomed us home when we came home to the church. So that's why that beautiful painting's there. Mm. Behind me, uh, many people think I look like a politician in front of the State House in Washington, D.C. That's not the State House. That's St. Peter's, the Dome of St. Peter's behind me, uh, recognizing coming home to the Church of Peter. Mm. Okay, we recognize that. But in the middle, there's another picture. You may not know what that is. And that is a bridge over the Tiber River. And we often use the symbol of jumping the Tiber, mm. swimming the Tiber. And the symbol of that is often because we are, we're familiar with our side of the Tiber River, but we aren't familiar with the other side yet, and it can be scary. Mm -hmm. What's it going to be like over there? I know, I know God was good to me over here. What's it going to be like over there? Mm -hmm. I know what I can do on this side. I know what my gifts are. I know I can serve him. What am I going to be able to do over there? Because it's a strange country on the other side of the Tiber. Right. And that's what that symbol is, which is what you explained. Right. And I think there's one other reason, too, that I, I failed to mention, Roger, was that I knew I would have to eat a lot of humble pie because, <laughs> you know, my, when my sister became a Catholic, I gave her a lot of grief over it because I was a, a Bible-thumping evangelical and, and said, you know, <laughs> that's wrong. Here's why, you know, all these uh, misconceptions that I had held for uh, of the Catholic Church, I had passed along to others, so I knew I... I would have to eat my words. Yeah. Let's, I've got an email here from, from Father Joseph from Michigan. He says, Dear Marcus and Carl, glory to Jesus Christ. 
What part did the real presence of Christ in the Holy Eucharist play in your journey to the church? In Christ Jesus, Father Joseph. Thank you, Father, for your email. It's a huge part. Uh, <clears throat> first, first of all, just theologically speaking, um, when I looked at the church fathers, realizing that they believed in the real presence of Christ right from the get-go and made no bones about, about it. You know, this is the flesh and blood of Christ. Um, so knowing that the church has always taught that it was very compelling to me. And then, you know, every time I'd open up the Bible, I was confronted with those, those verses. And if I wanted to take Christ at his word, I mean, he just said, this is my body. This is my blood. If I'm going to take him at his word, that's what he means. And so that was very much a, a compelling point for me because I wanted to be obedient. I wanted to be a believer of what Jesus had said. All right. Let's take another a phone call. Kevin from Pennsylvania. Hello, Kevin. What's your question? Uh, hello, Marcus. Uh, I would like to say first that I really enjoy your show. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I have a qu quick question for Carl. What was your view on the papacy as a being raised in a Lutheran household and going through multiple Protestant denominations? I was just wondering what your view on the Holy Father was. Thanks, Thanks Kevin. Yeah, as a, as a Lutheran, I had no animosity whatsoever. I mean, my, my mother uh, is a very kind-hearted woman and didn't uh, infect me with <laughs> those papists, you know, don't trust them or whatever. So I never had anything like that, but I think um, after I moved into more evangelical circles, you know, being introduced to um, those tracks from Jack, Ch Jack Chick, yeah. um, those elements of being very anti-Pope did come into play. And of course, I was, at the time, I was ignorant to um, what the church had always taught and, and uh, the church fathers knowing that there's been a line of popes from day one, starting with Peter and, and on. I, I tried to remember, my, I was brought up Lutheran too, and I wonder if it was the same for you, that in many ways I wasn't anti the pope, but the pope wasn't just on the screen at all. Right. Didn't really think much about the pope as a part of the equation. Right, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, I, didn't, I felt no animosity towards him, but didn't think about him didn't at all. Didn't think about him at all, right. Let's take this... Uh, uh, email from uh, Damien, dear Marcus and Carl, God bless you both for coming home to the one true church. My question is, how do I explain the sacrament of confession to our non-Catholic brothers and sisters? That's a good question. I, I guess I would start with uh, the Gospel of John, where Jesus, upon being raised from the dead, he goes to visit the, the disciples and breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. And he, then he says those startling words. He says, whosoever sins you forgive, they'll be forgiven. Whosoever sins you retain, they'll be retained. And uh, that's what I look to as the, as the beginning of that sacrament. Yeah. I know that very often um, as an evangelical, I would go to the James passage, excuse me, the, the first John passage, excuse me, 1-9, where it says, whatever you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse them from all unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. We would go to that passage, but we forget about that John 20 passage. Right. But you've got to put them together, and then that helps you understand the need and the power of confession. Hmm. Let's take one final break, and then in a moment we'll come back with some final thoughts from the journey home. Welcome back. Carl, let's, uh, let's assume that there are some viewers, listeners that are at the same place you were. In fact, we know from some of the emails that we got from callers that some people are still in that spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. What would you like to say to them, maybe as a closing thought on encouragement for them to make the same journey you've made? 
Well, I, I guess I would say uh, don't be afraid to throw your best questions at the church. And uh, because I think you will find if you have an open heart that it's an impenetrable fortress, that if you seek truth and throw your best questions at it, you're going to find those answers. And just become with an open heart about it. All right, very good. Now, I mentioned earlier <coughs> that we're going to close the show a little bit differently because it, as the, during the credits at the end of the program, uh, they're going to hear one of your songs, right? Tell us a little bit about it. Well, the song is called Seeing Jesus Soon. It's off my first CD. And uh, I thought it would be a good song to, to introduce tonight because of the fact that, you know, I was asking God for a miracle and uh, a, a sign, and God just brought me right back to, you're going to have to step out in faith, which I think is uh, what a lot of people are going to have to do. You know, people are, are watching this program, and you're thinking, maybe I, I would like to become a Catholic, but boy, it would be nice to have a sign. <laughs> And it might be that God's going to call you to also take a step of faith. And that's what the song talks about, that uh, like we, not many of us have that St. Thomas kind of experience, you know, where we get to, you say, yeah. unless I see with my own eyes and put my hands in the marks, I will not believe. You know, Jesus speaks to the rest of us saying, blessed yeah. are those who believe having not seen. And uh, that's where you and I are. Yeah. So they'll hear a little snippet of, what's the name of the song they'll hear? Seeing Jesus Soon. Okay. And if they want to hear more of the song or find out more of your songs, what's that website again? Yeah, my website is www.k4communications.com and all my songs are downloadable as MP3s. So. All right. Thanks a lot. You know, your story, is, I think, was very powerful. And thank you, Carl, for sharing that with us. Um, your life is an evidence of the work of the Spirit. Because if you think back, you know, there was a time when you weren't interested and all of a sudden, by God's grace, boom. Mm -hmm. A verse touches your life and then here you are on television tell everyone about your love for Jesus Christ. And to me, you know, those of you who are watching, that's to me a vivid example of how God can not just touch us but use us to change the lives of others if we allow ourselves to be a vessel of his grace as he mentioned part of it's letting go and letting God touch our lives and then listening to God trusting that he's guiding us knowing that he loves us knowing that he's given us abilities to use for his glory and then being available to do that and sometimes not knowing where he's going to take us on the other side of the Tiber, but saying, Lord, I'll go wherever you want to go, whatever you want to do with me. I mean, that's the, the, the surrender that you made to him many years ago, then here you are. That's right. And especially those whose children have left the church, Carl's life is an example that God can do great things. So, Carl, thank you for j your witness and thank joining you. with us, and also for your song that we're going to hear in a moment. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. And God bless you. Be with you again next week. I'm all alone And yet there's someone there I've never seen his face or touched his hand But there's a calm assurance in my heart And I'm beginning I've never seen 